Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. I'm delighted to return to Reese P. Dubin and the delightful book, Telecult Power, The Amazing New Way to Psychic and Occult Wonders. I have one other episode where we've gone over some of the stuff from this book, and that was called Your Mental Earphone, which uniquely explains how you can telepathically listen to other people's thoughts and give some unique exercises and suggestions. I got some additional requests to go back to the Dubin material. So there's an amazing chapter in this book called Your Psychic Televiewer, How to See Beyond Walls and to Great Distances. In this particular chapter, we learn about using telecult vision and psychic visual experiences beyond the range of normal sight. This is uniquely powerful, and as we move into the new earth and we discover our new abilities, these old books which described how to use them come in incredibly handy. Reese P. Dubin was one of the anonymous sort of writers that wrote with Parker Publishing. He may have been another more famous author writing under anonymous names. In any case, the book is great and I highly recommend it. Your Psychic Televiewer, How to See Beyond Walls and to Great Distances. I looked in my crystal and saw Mr. B, hunting for a paper in the drawers of a writing table. He used a particular pen, which I described, and with his hands ruffled his hair till it stood up in a kind of halo. A lady came in and pointed to his hair and laughed. All this was found to be correct. He had been looking for a paper which he wanted to send by post. And his sister, whom I had never seen, and did not know she lived with him, had entered the room and pointed laughing to his hair, just as I had seen. Mrs. Goodrich Freer in Enigmas of Psychical Research by James Hislop. This is telecult vision. It includes all psychic visual experiences beyond the range of normal sight, including clairvoyance, the power to see over great distances, X-ray vision, the power to see through barriers such as locked steel boxes, solid brick walls, and sealed envelopes, and thought transference, the power to see what another person is thinking or seeing. It may surprise you to learn that you've already covered some of the steps necessary to enjoy this power. If you've read and practiced the steps in the preceding section on telecult hearing, the main feature that both of these techniques have in common is that a mental impression is in this case, visual is received. For example, one of the techniques of telecult hearing, receiving thoughts through touch, can also transmit visual impressions. As an illustration of this, Peter Herko says, when I shake hands with a stranger, I know immediately his character, his private life, even the house in which he lives. I receive a series of images like those thrown on a screen by a film projector, the hidden antenna that you were born with in the human television screen. In normally sighted people, whether they wear glasses or not, it is the optic nerves that contribute in large measure to the phenomenon of telecult vision. Each optic nerve is not just a nerve, but rather like a horn or antenna that extends from your brain to your eyes. It consists of gathered nerve fibers from different parts of your brain, and your retina or the back of the eye to which your optic nerve leads is unlike any other sense organ. According to the best known anatomists, it is almost exactly like a television screen. Some of the fibers of your optic nerves lead from your eyes directly into your brain. This enables you to see, but some of these fibers lead from your brain to your eyes, permitting you to project thought forms or mental pictures to your eyes as in dreaming or daydreaming. In thought transference, these pictures leave your eyes in the form of nerve electricity, which is nothing but heat. These heat waves are then projected like a thousand pictures on a strip of film into the electron atmosphere around us. They are received by another person in the very form in which they were created. This is in the form of heat waves. As these heat waves touch the retina, the back of the eye, they are converted into nerve electricity and sent to the visual center of your brain where they are seen. 
the amazing psychic televiewer. With thought transference, actual sights and sounds may be picked up by telecult vision and telecult hearing if the person happens to be concentrating on them. In this case, his eyes and ears act somewhat like a television camera that picks up and transmits sight and sound to your television set, your mental television set, or psychic televiewer. And when you tune in on someone, you see what he sees, hear what he hears, be it a letter, a picture, some physical object, or some scene before him, as in a game of cards. It is best to exercise great discretion if you should find yourself receiving such transmissions, as they may be of a personal nature. When this happens, it is best to tune off merely by thinking of something else, directing your attention elsewhere. If you do not, then the next time you meet him, you're apt to slip and mention something you have seen or heard. This may greatly annoy him and may even cost you his friendship. But as I say, if you do not abuse this power, you will not be abused by it. How to tune the picture on your psychic televiewer. In telecult vision, the actual mental picture of what another person is thinking is received by you. Since most people think in a combination of words and pictures, often the mental picture you receive will include initials, written words, or numerals, like captions on a television picture. These psychic picture captions usually include such information as names of people and places, birth dates, and ages of people involved. These are written generally in no particular order across the screen of your mind. To practice tuning in on people's thoughts, proceed as follows. Step 1. Look up, close your eyes, and stare at the patterns you see, called hemagogic images or pictures on the back of the eyelids. If you see nothing, shut your eyes as tightly as you can for as long as possible, and study the patterns before you. Like a child watching a cloud formation, use your imagination to decide what it is and what it may mean. From your thoughts into words, preferably spoken aloud, as you vocalize them, your image will tend to focus itself and confirm the accuracy of your speculation. Step 2. Soon you will find yourself sliding into a kind of dreamlike reverie, during which the mind may be focused on any person, place, or event desired. This is a light self-hypnosis that can be shaken off quite easily with any sudden movement of the body. In this state, you are vaguely aware of such things as street sounds, a dripping faucet, perhaps the ticking of a clock, but they do not bother you. Afterwards, you will feel more completely relaxed and invigorated than if you had just had eight hours of sleep, which is why some people call it quick sleep. What you're really doing, however, is awakening telecult vision. Step 3. It is now that your third eye or mind's eye may be focused on that which you wish to see. When this happens, think of the person whose mind you wish to read. Picture him as situated wherever he is likely to be, seated at his desk, at the office, or at home in his living room watching television or doing some chore. Focus your attention on him or her. It is now possible to determine your friend's thinking on any given matter. Relax deeply your eyes closed, allowing your mind to fix. If you feel the need of focusing your attention on something, on the mental image of your friend in his surroundings. Step 4. If it is possible for you to obtain a fresh or recent photograph of your friend in home or office, it is permissible to refresh your memory every now and then by glancing at it and then closing your eyes. In view of the radiation qualities of such a photograph, it is best to hold it in your hand at all times during the experiment. The fresher and more recent the photograph, the better, which is why I recommend that you take or use a Polaroid shot. If you have no such photograph, but still wish to enhance your chances of contact, use some other simple object that has been in close contact with your friend's body, and preferably no one else's, or some object that he or she looks at frequently, Step 5. Perhaps most importantly of all, make every effort to pick a time when you feel your friend is probably most relaxed, 
or in a good mood. From a distance, of course, it is not always possible for you to be absolutely certain of this. Nevertheless, there are many ways for you to determine his or her probable mood. A telephone conversation at some point during the day, perhaps, or the mood of the person when you last saw him at work, for example. The purpose of this technique is to attune you to another person's mind at a distance. Frequent practice will reveal many facts about this person to you. Once you have succeeded in actually reading someone's mind, it will be much easier for you to pick up his or her thoughts in the future, no matter where you are, no matter how great the distance that separates you, though it be across a room, a city, or a continent, even through walls and actual physical barriers. Note, if you should receive a hearing impression instead of a mental picture, this is good too, although it is not exactly what we are looking for at this stage. Ideally, you should receive both sight and sound. One should never strive too hard, however. If you receive one kind of impression consistently, accept it gratefully and leave it at that. As an example of how the psychic televiewer works in actual practice, Arthur H., a carpenter by trade who used it as a hobby, recently reported how he used it to read the mind of a complete stranger. With this method, he saw that the man had certain photographs concealed in his wallet, which he was able to describe in complete detail. He read a letter which was tucked inside the stranger's pocket, tastefully omitting some intimate details to the genuine amusement of interested onlookers. And he described many other names, places, dates, and events in exact detail, all of which proved to be true. Here is a method recommended by L.W. DeLawrence in his book, India's Hood Unveiled, to increase the power of telecult vision. Get a small quantity of printing ink, say five drops. Mix it well with two drops of turpentine. Then put the paste on a piece of glass, a mirror will do, or on a green leaf, maple leaf preferred, making a circle about one-eighth of an inch wide. Take this device into a quiet room, light a single lamp of low voltage, keep it on a raised level on the northern side of your seat so that the recollection may come from the north. Keep the leaf with the circle of paste in its middle in your left palm and hold it within a distance of one to two feet from the lamp so that a distinct ray of light may fall on the paste. Then attain a state of passivity by relaxing your mind and body and gaze intently at the reflection created on the paste. After a short time, small luminous circles will appear and gradually develop into bigger ones. Some shape or figure will burst in. If you continue to look at it, these forms will take a definite course. By continuous practice, past and present events will be clearly depicted and enacted before you. When you attain this state at will, command any scene or scenes which might have occurred in the past or may occur in the future to appear. By the aid of this method, hidden treasures, lost property, murders, crimes, robberies, etc. can be easily discovered, says Dr. DeLawrence. It should be noted, by the way, that in all the steps given thus far, mental impressions, sights and sounds were received from another person's mind. In many of the steps that follow, the same will be true. Indeed, most of the extrasensory perception that is employed by those who know how to use it makes use of other people's minds, even people who are not known to the receiver, since the higher mind eventually develops to the point where it is sensitized to all minds, everywhere. What is going on in another room or another city, what you may really be doing is using the minds of those present as though they were television cameras or microphones transmitting to you. But it is important for you to realize that telecult power need not stop with the use of other people's minds. You have a third or inner eye capable of perceiving visual impressions directly. No one need send these pictures to you for the simple reason that all objects constantly send out radiations, vibrating electromagnetically charged particles in their exact shape. These vibrating particles are actually electrons, the tiniest element known. Everything that exists consists of electrons which tend to group together with varying density. The denser or thicker they get, the more visible they become. For example, everyone knows that a rock or a door appears to be solid, but scientists know 
they are just masses of vibrating electrons. These electrons set other particles nearby in motion and an electrical image of the rock is formed. In fact, many images of the rock are formed, radiating in all directions. These images remain in the air after the original object is destroyed, which is why Ted Sirios can record on film his perception of buildings he has never seen which were torn down long ago. In his book Modern Spiritualism, Frank Podmore narrates a well-supported case in which telecult vision was used like a compass to find the sum of 650 pounds of money that had disappeared. An empty envelope which had contained the money was put into the clairvoyant's hand. As you recall, in telecult power number one, such an object acts as a kind of invisible link between itself and anything that has been near it. The clairvoyant soon saw that two banknotes and a bill of exchange had been handed in at a bank and they would be found in an envelope with other papers in an inner room at the bank. These documents were subsequently found amongst some old papers on the mantelpiece in the manager's private room. Psychic televiewer finds jeweled brooch. In his book, My Occult Diary, Cornelius Tabori tells how telecult vision was used again like a compass to find a jewel, which had been lost by Mrs. Kalman, since telecult vision is a power that can be used by anyone who believes absolutely and completely in its existence, and since hypnotism is a state of heightened suggestibility. A young man was hypnotized for the purpose of finding his jewel. He was sent back to the time and place where Mrs. Kalman had been shortly before her loss. In this state, the young man described how Mrs. Kalman had inadvertently knocked the brooch off while brushing away a fly, how it had been picked up by a dachshund and buried in the garden of the house where it had been lost. By means of this information, the jewel was recovered three days later. The literature is full of cases of hypnotically induced mental powers. In the famous Janet Gilbert experiments, a subject, Madame B, was hypnotized and sent on a traveling clairvoyance from La Havre to Professor Richet's house in Paris. Her physical body, of course, remained in La Havre. When she claimed to be there, she cried out in great agitation, It is burning! It is burning! The next day was found that Professor Richet's laboratory had in fact been damaged by fire. The well-known Swedish psychotherapist and psychic researcher John Bjorkman made similar experiments. In one of them, he sent a lap girl to describe the scene in her home several hundred miles away. He was able to tell Bjorkman exactly what her parents were doing and even what paragraph in the paper her father was reading. This was verified immediately by telephone. Psychic Televiewer reveals diplomatic secrets. In a hypnotist casebook, Alexander Erskine describes how the hypnotized son of a diplomat was able to tell him exactly where his, the boy's father was, to whom he was speaking, and what their conversation was about. The young man's father bound Erskine never to repeat the experiment. Since all visual impressions must be transmitted to the visual center of the brain, it is quite possible for blind people to see provided that there is no brain damage. If, for example, every other means of transmitting visual images to the brain were destroyed, it could still perceive them through its visual control center. The brain itself, as we have seen in Telecult Power 1, has billions of microscopic hair cells called fibrils or fibrillae. These cells are extremely sensitive to any and all electrical impressions around them, and they are in constant waving motion exactly like directional antenna. Thus, we have numerous cases on record of people who have been able to see out the back or top of their heads. The famous German researcher, Dr. Albert von Schresnatzing, reported in 1887 how a subject named Lena was able, under hypnosis, to read books through the top of her head while effectively blindfolded. Perhaps the most famous case of this nature is that of Molly Fancher. Molly Fancher was born in 1848 and lived in the same house for 50 years, some 30 of which were spent in bed after two serious accidents that left her permanently blind and crippled. And yet she could see as clearly as any normal person, clear in fact. Molly's case was studied by Judge Abram H. Daly, who published a book in 1894, recounting the many experiences he had with the woman. 
A reviewer of the book for the Society for Psychical Research said that Judge Daly had recorded the narratives of many witnesses whose truthfulness no one could question. In Judge Daly's book, Molly's doctor, Dr. Spear, makes the following statement. We have caused a careful and critical examination of her eyes to be made by a competent expert, an occultist, and agree with him that she cannot see by the use of her eyes. Yet she had the power of seeing with a great deal of distinctness, as she put it, out of the top of her head. At one time, she did all her work, crocheting, etc., in this manner. She's able to distinguish colors, even to the most delicate shades, not only when absolutely concealed from her normal sight, but while in the pocket of someone who did not know the color of the article to be described. She could read letters placed upon her forehead, or merely by touching them. She could read with many times the rapidity of one reading by eyesight, by running her finger over the printed pages in light or darkness. She invariably knew what was going on in the room around her and could describe the minutest movements of her guests. Besides immediate cognition of her surroundings, Molly's vision was able to go beyond the bounds of the room in which she happened to be lying. In this manner, she could see the location of lost objects around the house. She was able to look around the city and find out what was going on. To Judge Daly, she once described a man whom she had never met, but whom she had seen at the judge's house a few days before. Mrs. Fancher's case of clairvoyance is one of the most thoroughly documented in the history of psychic research. Hundreds of witnesses saw the feats which she could perform, but there are numerous cases just like it. Scientists have long known the entire epidermis or outer skin covering of the body contains photoelectric cells that transmit actual seeing impressions to the brain. The process of stimulating the skin to the point where it becomes light sensitive is none other than the basic process of skin sensitization cited in Telecult Power One. Cesar Lombroso, the world famous psychologist, recorded that he had a patient, an Italian girl who was quite blind, but saw as clearly as before with the tip of her nose and the lobe of her left ear. Another case is reported by Professor Camagnola in the Italian Journal of Medical Science of a young girl, also 14, in the Lombroso case, who, though blind, could see easily with the palms of her hands. In both the aforementioned cases, the subjects could read any printed matter selected at random. The Complete Home Course in Crystal Gazing Crystal gazing is another form of telecult vision, and the crystal ball a kind of televiewer, mirror scope, or telephoto transmitter that helps you concentrate. To quote Frank R. Young, a crystal ball itself is not necessary so long as its substitute possesses a shiny surface to stare at. An intensely shiny surface reflects so much light that it temporarily stuns the nerve endings of the optic nerve in your retina so that your eyes perceive only the brightest surfaces within the field of vision and overlook the rest that are darker. The effect partially hypnotizes your conscious and subconscious minds and your inner eye then assumes control. Crystal gazing is an ancient and widely practiced art. Through its use, many strange things have happened. Crimes have been solved, lost articles have been found, hidden facts in the lives of people have been uncovered, and unrealized aspects of one's relationship with others have been revealed. Though crystal gazing has been used with some remarkable success in piecing together the facts of the past, its chief use, both by professional seers and others, is to look into the future and discover what is about to happen or what may happen unless precautions are taken. How the Crystal Ball or Mirror Scope Works I have tried various objects in crystal gazing, writes Mrs. Verall, in enigmas of psychical research, such as cut crystal, a globular crystal, a glass paperweight, and a glass full of water. I find no difference in their efficacy. I've also tried under varying conditions of light, with the conclusion that a dim light is the most likely to result in the seeing of a picture. I have sometimes seen pictures in quite bright light, but never in absolute darkness. Often I see nothing at all but the bright points of light in the crystal, and often I see nothing in the crystal but get a mental picture suggesting something. I have forgotten to do. Indeed, I find crystal gazing a very convenient way of recalling things forgotten. But in that case, I see nothing in the crystal. The difference between a picture in the crystal and a mental picture is quite marked, but difficult to describe. 
It will perhaps help to show what I mean if I say that the recalled image of what I have seen in the crystal differs as much from the actual image as the mental image of a person differs from the actual person. I believe that with me, the crystal picture is built up from bright points in the crystal as they sometimes enter into it. But the picture, when once produced, has a reality which I have never been able to obtain when trying to call up an imaginary scene with my eyes shut. It has occasionally happened when I have been able to see more on closer investigation than on the first glance. But if I try to interpose a magnifying glass between my eye and the crystal, the picture instantly goes and only recollection remains. The following case is when I have seen a real person. The picture grew distinct as I looked. I saw a black object would define itself into the head of a man. Then I saw it, that it was my husband's head turned nearly profile toward my left. Behind it was a squared back chair of brown leather. He was reading, his eyes being on a book, which I could not see. I tried to see the whole figure in order to know what the book was and shut my eyes. On opening them, I saw the whole figure for a moment, but it was too small for me to distinguish anything. Crystal gazing helps recall forgotten facts. There's an extraordinary phenomena in psychology called peripheral vision. It means that we see things out of the corners of our eyes without realizing it. The same thing happens with hearing. These impressions escape us merely because we were concentrating on something else at the time, but they enter our minds just the same our subconscious minds and can be recalled either accidentally or on purpose. Crystal gazing enables you to do this at will. Miss Goodrich Freer gives us some clear examples of this in Enigmas of Psychical Research. I had carelessly destroyed a letter, she writes, without preserving the address of my correspondent. A very short inspection of the crystal supplied me with H House in gray letters on a white background. She posted her letter to this address and it turned out to be correct. In another instance, she writes, I saw in the crystal a young girl, an intimate friend waving to me from her carriage. I observed that her hair, which had hung down her back when I last saw her, was now up in young lady fashion, the look of which I knew very well. But the next day, I called on my friend, was reproached by her for not observing her as she passed, and perceived that she had altered her hair in the way which the crystal had shown. The first requirement for successful crystal gazing is to relax so thoroughly that your mind becomes a complete blank. Follow the steps for deep relaxation given for telecult power number one. Without deep relaxation, one cannot see in the crystal. The second prerequisite is not to stare at the crystal without blinking. Instead, merely gaze at it calmly and easily. Do not worry about whether you will see anything. Try to think instead of what you wish to see. Think about it steadily for a while then let your mind go blank. This will seem hard at first, but practice will help you, and practice makes perfect. Never sit in total darkness, but rather in a dimly lit room, the light coming from a window or a low-voltage bulb. The light should be coming from in back of you, never in front. It is best to rest the crystal on a table in a suitable cup or stand. It is also good to cover the table with black cloth. Beneath the crystal, this helps in concentrating. There should be no noise in the room, The slightest moving of a chair or loud breathing can distract you and make complete concentration impossible. Crystal gazing requires much practice. At first, you may not succeed. In time, however, you will succeed in visualizing that which you wish to see. To visualize a specific person, place, or thing, picture it as you last remember it or as you imagine it to be. When you have this mental picture as clear as you can get it, relax completely and deeply. Cease trying to visualize anything and let your mind go blank, like a white screen before the movie starts. As you gaze in the crystal and your concentration becomes complete, after a time you will see the crystal becoming cloudy. It will be as if a milky cloud were forming and filling it. This is the sign the spell is operating. The final stage is when this cloud-like formation gives way to what you're looking for. Often the picture will be startlingly clear. You will find in the crystal scenes which are meaningful to you, you may see people, houses, places, where you have never been, words or sentences, symbols or other objects which have a meaning for you. If you're giving a reading for someone other than yourself, you should tell only what you see, even if it means nothing to you. Just 
be a reporter who is perfectly honest. In this way, you will build up skill in seeing and describing and very often the other person will supply the missing information or meaning. Do not tell all you see in the crystal if what you see is bad. Practice in crystal gazing will give you a talent which can help in your personal life and bring a great deal of entertainment to any group, possibly even some extra income. There's one class of telecult vision for which there are many explanations, and that is precognition, or seeing the future. Is it possible in dreams and visions to see the future? Amazingly enough, some persons apparently can do this. Under favorable conditions, it is possible that most people can do it. Indeed, do do it without being conscious of it. What you may be seeing with telecult vision are past events in your own life or in the lives of others, in which case you may have read about it somewhere, which were similar in scope and nature to the present situation. Telecult vision helps bring such forgotten memories to the surface of your mind, as in peripheral vision mentioned above. Then again, your vision may be telepathic. What you see may actually be future plans in people's minds received by you telepathically. And finally, your visions of the future may indeed be brought on by spirits capable of sensing the shaping up of things and transmitting this knowledge to you. There's one additional possibility which is not really prophecy. It is based on a mild form of deception, self-deception really. It is when the prophet doesn't really see the future but thinks he does or pretends. A suggestion is then planted in the mind of the other person, whose fortune is being told. In other words, it is the power of suggestion working in the individual that makes the fortune come true. Many wonderful deeds have been accomplished as well as some bad with this mild form of deception. Dream Winners at the Track One man who used this technique, Michael V, 52, saw a horse race at Hialeah. According to the vision, a certain jockey would be riding winners in two races the following Saturday. The vision also told who would place and show. On the day of the races, all horses came in exactly as predicted. The winner of the first race paid $8.80. The next two horses placed showed $3.90 and $5.20. In the second race, the winner, a 15 to 1 shot, came in to pay $24.10 as the mutual window. All this is a matter of record, and Michael B. continued to have similar experiences. In another case, an English jockey named Fletcher discovered that he had a tendency to doze off and see things. One Sunday, for example, as he waited in a restaurant for lunch, he went into a half doze for a few seconds. What he saw was himself wearing the colors of a certain stable, mounted on a black filly, answering the bugle for a fifth race. He saw himself pulling up fast on the inside to finish first. Just then a waiter called him to the phone. It was the owner of this stable who wanted to know if he would ride a filly named Queen Beauty, a horse rated last in the eight-horse field at 30 to 1. Fletcher agreed and bet his full savings about $400 on Queen Beauty to win. The horse turned out to be the horse of the dream, and Fletcher actually did come in first. Fletcher's dreams and visions continued. He found that he could deliberately induce a light doze or trance merely by closing his eyes and relaxing. In this state, he could see not only races, but other events in the past or future. Summary of Telecult Power 1. Telecult vision includes all psychic visual experiences beyond the range of normal sight, including clairvoyance, the power to see over great distance, X-ray vision, the power to see through barriers such as locked steel boxes, solid brick walls, and sealed envelopes, and thought transference, the power to see what another person is thinking or seeing. The techniques of telecult hearing also prepare you for telecult vision. Most human beings are actually born with hidden antenna, somewhat like the storybook drawings of Martians, only these are very real. They are your optic nerves. Each optic nerve is not just a nerve, but rather like a horn or antenna that extends from your brain to your eye. Your mental television consists of the retina or back of each eye to which optic nerves lead. According to the best-known anatomist, each retina is almost exactly like a television screen. Some of the fibers of your optic nerves lead from your eyes directly to your brain. This enables you to see, but some of these fibers lead from your brain to your eyes, permitting you to project thought forms or mental pictures 
to your eyes as in dreaming or daydreaming. In thought transference, these pictures leave your eyes in the form of nerve electricity, which is nothing but heat. These heat pictures are imprinted in the atmosphere like a thousand pictures on a strip of film, which they are seen by psychically sensitive people. When you are reading someone's mind, his eyes and ears act like a television camera that picks up and transmits sight and sound to your television set, your mental television or psychic televiewer. 7. Telecult power need not stop with the use of other people's minds. All objects constantly send out radiations, vibrating electromagnetically charged particles in their exact shape which can be seen by a psychically sensitive person. 8. Crystal gazing is another form of telecult vision and the crystal ball a kind of televiewer or telephoto transmitter that helps you concentrate. A crystal ball itself isn't necessary so long as its substitute has a shiny surface to stare at. The light refractions temporarily stun the nerve endings of your optic nerves so that your eyes perceive only the brightest surfaces within the field of vision and overlook the rest which are darker. The effect partially hypnotizes you and puts you in a state of deep relaxation and receptiveness to psychic impression. This concludes this particular chapter on telecult vision. We will certainly return to this material because he has ways to broadcast silent commands and explorers opening up other powers that are super interesting. The telephoto transmitter among them. And so I definitely recommend that you check out the book, Telecult Powers. It is available on Kindle now. When I originally posted this, it wasn't. So I recommend you get that. But in any case, this is very similar to that first episode where you learned about your mental earphone. Your senses are so important. We really only understand and grasp the world through our five senses. That's all we have. But there's a whole lot more in the world that we don't sense. We understand the concept of a dog whistle, right? The whistle that we can't hear. Well, there's also sounds, there's sights, there's smells that we cannot sense in any way. There are unique aspects related to every one of our senses that when refined and studied will allow you to have psychic impressions that can be used to understand stuff from your past, from your future, to read minds, and are in the process of creation as well. Also, you can utilize this information by studying material like this, it gives you some different ideas and understandings of the way that you can utilize your senses to understand the outside world. As we move into the new earth in this reality revolution, our powers will increase. One of the more powerful things that we will start doing is reading people's minds. We can already do it, but we're going to get better and better at it to where it will become just a natural thing. Maybe not in my lifetime, but I believe that it's happening. There's more and more reports of people having these experiences, and now they're just sort of accepted, but we are not aware of it. More and more, there will be actual research done, and this will be verified and confirmed. It is an actual thing. You can send thoughts to others. You can see images. You can see images of the future. Check out the episode from William Walker Atkinson on crystal gazing. I read that book that he wrote. And it is powerful, something that was passed down to my family. My great-grandmother used to do this all the time. People would come to her and she would look in the crystal ball. The crystal ball is not special in any way. It's just something that is clear and shiny in a surface. It brings the light in a certain way and you can utilize your mind in a relaxed state to manipulate the light to see what may be happening in the future or what might have happened in the past or specific details about a situation. And as we learn these abilities, we will get better and better at it. I recently read the book by Sadhguru called Karma and he is avidly against the use of these powers in cities and says that he will do everything in his power to stop it, which is frustrating. He is saying that everything like this is a distraction spiritually. And I don't believe that. I think that we are meant to have a greater ability to read minds, to sense things. And as the Akashic awakens, we're given another outlet and we get this information from the Akashic. We'll be in a situation where we hear and see everybody's thoughts and it is available to you now, but you just may not be aware of it. 
eventually everyone will be knowing about it but it's happening now and so go back and work on these exercises right now when it's not as obvious and it will be to your advantage in any case if you'd like me to explore reese p dubin's material further i promise you i will we'll get to it eventually there's so much information here in any case you can find all episodes of the reality revolution at therealityrevolution.com and welcome to the reality revolution